Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley, joined by... Who are you, Chris? I'm Chris. Hey. Hi, everyone. Chris Connolly here, Virginia's colleague. Uh, <laughs> Long-time door-to-door resident. Good to be here. <laughs> and really fellow, fellow door-to-door resident, Lainey Mays. Lainey Mays. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We're so happy to be here, and we're so thrilled to bring two really special authors to our show today. We have New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Jocelyn Jackson here. She's written her 10th book, Mother May I. Oh, I can't wait to get into this book. Uh, this is about a mother who seemingly has the perfect life and her baby is stolen by a mysterious stranger. It opens up the door to a tragic twisty web of unfolding secrets and you don't know what's happening until you get to the end. Ugh. Jocelyn, don't give it away. <laughs> and Bolu Babalola, we are so thrilled to have you here as well. Love and Color, Mythical Tales from Around the World, Retold. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, debut story collection celebrating romance in all of its forms. You have taken these these mythological tales and turn them on their heads. And it is so exciting to talk to you about these. So thank you both so much for coming on the show today and talking to us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Bola, where are you right now? I'm in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm British, but um, I came here in December and then I was like, I'm just gonna stay for a little bit because <laughs> it's hot here and it's cold in England and it's a lockdown in England. So. Here I am. <laughs> Beautiful. That's wonderful. Well, thank goodness for strong internet connections. And Jocelyn, where are you? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Exactly. How's the weather? Um, it's really stinking cold and gross, which is, you know, very shocking for us. Everybody's making making fun of us. I haven't I don't I haven't left the house in two days, but I mean I haven't left the house in two days, so whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that that crazy cold snap is making is making the news big time up here. It's unbelievable. Texas. Oh, God. Well, anyway, we're going to get to weather and books and what we're doing in quarantine and all that funny stuff. So we'll um, right now, I think, Jocelyn, we're going to put you in the virtual green room. So have fun. No shenanigans. We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> OK. Hi, Bolu. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're so excited to have you here. Um, your book, oh my God, that, do you love that cover? Oh my gosh, I, the first time I saw it, I, I cried. I was oh. so overtaken with emotion. I love it so much. Yeah, it's, it's just gorgeous. Um, so, um, you know, you've taken these these ten there are ten stories in the book, yeah, and um, you really, mm -hmm. really have turned these upside down and looked at these uh, tales um, in a very different way. And uh, all right, I'll not talk, and I'll have you tell librarians what it is that you want them to know about this book, and then we'll get into some of those cool stories. So yeah, it takes it takes inspiration from folk tales and mythology from around the world, from Africa, Middle East, Asia. Asia. And what it does is kind of it centers the women in these stories and then removes the patriarchy and the misogyny and the violence and kind of reworks them, modernizes them. I put I kind of say that I'm remixing them and putting a lot of myself into that, whilst also kind of putting making sure the roots of where it comes from stay the same. So themes of valor, of bravery, of course, love remain while I kind of just revamp them and kind of center the women and make it about a woman's desire rather than a man choosing her. Yeah, that is so clear in all these stories. That's the, your common thread, giving women agency, which I just, uh, I, I, I think in one of them, you, you said that the man is really just sort of like the, like the, like the cherry on the top of a cake that's already fully baked and made and like that's yeah. the extra. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what made you choose the one, how did you choose the, 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 um, the, f the folk tales and the, 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 the stories that you chose? Why did you choose the ones that you chose? 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to know how you, out of everything that there is out there, why did you pick those? Yeah. So yeah, I read a lot. I sifted through them. And I, again, I just found themes that I really resonated with. And obviously, I learned a lot of the stories, like a lot of like even medieval Western European fairy tales. The women are kind of like damsels in distress. Mm. So in a lot of the tales, what I took was like the traits of the man, actually, and just gave them to the woman. And then, and then the good themes of the stories, like the morals and what it tells us about humanity and our connections, I pulled that out. And I was like, okay, I can work with this. I can put my own spin on this. I can make this my own, whilst also paying roots to the culture and the richness of the worlds that they come from. Um, but it was really about the woman speaking to me. Like when I read the stories, I was like, okay, what, what does my heroine look like in the story? Um, how can she drive the story? So I let the stories kind of inform the characters that I was going to build. Yeah, um, you wrote in here that many of the, um, I'm, I'm looking at the introduction. Um, yeah. and, uh, I mean, it's really, you, you know, you, this is a book that you really, you can pick it up any at any point and just, yeah. you know, it's very hard to put it down. It, um, it does not read like a novel, but there is this common theme uh, throughout and it's, it's very hard to stop. I found it very hard to oh. stop. <laughs> Thank um, you. But you say that um, you explored how the power of love has been expressed through a variety of cultures around the world and that these are, um, you, you, you're paying tribute to the textures of each original tale. As you say, you're trying to keep the sort of the bones, I guess, of it. Um, yeah. That just flip it a bit. Um, exactly. Like yeah. um, in Sia's story, that's a good example of that. Um, in Sia's story, the original, Sia's an author army in general, and Maddie, her love interest, is her second in command. In the original story, uh, Maddie is an army general, and she is like a damsel in distress that he's engaged to, and he basically has to like fight like a seven-headed snake god to save her, his virgin damsel in distress. So in my story, Sia is the commander, Maddie is her second in charge, and that, that, that's a power dynamic that I really wanted to like make clear, is that he supports her and he's, he's in awe of her power and is not, never kind of intimidated or is insecure by it. And I flipped in the back. I don't, not to spoil anything, but she kind of, in the end, has to kind of save him. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it, I just wanted to like kind of flip the gender expectations and, and show their relationship as a partnership. So I paid homage to the original tale because that tells kind of about sacrifice, like fighting for somebody you love and wanting to save them, protect them. And then use that to kind of build a partnership in my story. Um, can you talk about, um, is it Nalele? Is that Nalele, yes, yes. Yes. I love that Oscar. one. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so Nalele is, um, she has a skin condition, um, which means that she's kind of ostracized from her. It's a high school story. It's in high school. Um, high school kind of like, and she's like in love with the jock, but I flip it a little bit to make the jock like a childhood best friend. And they kind of grow apart because he becomes popular and she's kind of ostracized because of her skin condition. And that story is about self, I mean, they're all about self-love and self-empowerment. All of my heroines are on their own journey of discovery and strength. But it's also about being seen for who you are and always being seen for who you are. And she doesn't change herself for the ob ob object of perfections. So even as she's insecure, she's like, she is insecure and in her journey. She always kind of has this feeling of like, I still don't want to change for anybody else. Like I know that I'm going through this, but also like, I'm not going to like change myself to fit in into your world. And that was really important to me because it was set in high school. And I really wanted young women to read this and be like, you don't need to change yourself for the affections of a boy or anybody you're into. Like they should accept you for who you are. Um, but in the original story, Nelly actually had crocodile skin. She was her name. Was, uh, was basically like, like crocodile skin and she had, had a coat of crocodile skin because she was so beautiful and her parents didn't want um, kind of her to be preyed on. Um, and then in the original story, she's kind of, she is preyed on because um, somebody sees her without her crocodile skin and she's bathing by the lake. And there's just all these predatory stuff. So I was like, mm. hey, how can I make, how can I flip this while still kind of keeping like the tone of it, like of mm -hmm. the crocodile skin and, make that into a kind of empowering story yeah i found that really so you is in this story she has vitiligo right yeah she has vitiligo yes 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, and I, and I really wanted to make it clear. Sorry, go on. No, no. What did you say? You, you want to make it clear that what? Yeah. And I really wanted to make it clear that Cosi, or the Cosi is the male love interest, her, her, um, the guy she likes. Um, he's always liked her. But because he's he's blinded by his own privilege as like a good looking guy who kind of moves through the world so easily, he doesn't really see the issues that she goes through. Um, so I wanted to, to be like, you know, somebody can be a good person, but also be flawed and not seeing what you're seeing because of their privilege. So in that story, I also wanted to go into like the complexes of relationships. Like sometimes someone, it's not like someone's bad or good. Sometimes they have to go through their own journey of realization and learning and growth. Right, right. I was reading about how you don't really like, you don't really like to be considered nice or you don't like characters to be nice because that's just the sort of like people who are just sort of being yeah. people pleasers. But like, let's get down to yeah, it. Yeah, like nice is like, exactly. Nice is so dependent on what other people think. And I think good and kind are good definit definitive things. Like they mean something, but we're nice. Like, I don't really know what that means, how to define that, you know? And so again, with my heroines, I want them to be defined. Like Nelly is, she's, she's not like a, a pushover. She's a lovely girl, but she's not like, she's not gonna take, you know, she's not gonna take crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you totally get that. Especially at the end, it's like, she's already good. She's already good. You know, regardless yeah, exactly. of what he does or what he says, and he's yeah. So, um, um, Chris, you and I were talking earlier. You want to um, talk about Shahrazad and um, the uh, thousand thousand and what? Where am I here? You got it, Chris. The thousand one Arabian Nights. You're oh right. yeah, I mean, I just because I think I would, you know, tragedy is part of love as well, and that's. And, and longing and I just found that story so unforgettable and stirring oh thank would, you of, would you mind talking a little bit about writing writing that story it's relatively yeah. short but so powerful I loved it so um that was a story that kind of came to me I just read because I was I was kind of mulling on it for a while it was just in the back of my head I was working, working my other stories and part of me was like let me just lose it it's just too difficult to do I don't know how I'm going to do this like a story within stories but I was like then something clicked I was like what if I make her a storyteller and what if she tells her tells stories to protect herself from love and when I kind of figured out who she is and kind of built this kind of dystopian kind of political world it kind of kind of came together um, and I really enjoyed writing her actually because she's a girl she's a woman rather um, a woman who kind of rejects romance almost and rejects softness but then finds herself really empowered and strengthened by it which I really enjoy I enjoyed writing her journey I kind of flipping it a little bit because in the story the guy is a softer one really he's the one's like listen I love you <laughs> and she's the one's like oh I don't know if I'm ready for a commitment even though I am deeply in love with you um yeah it was really fun to write her yeah, it's amazing how closely you come to feel and know those two characters and again such a short amount of time they just they really stick with me so thank you for that and i know you're described you. as a, uh, oh, a like a uh, a rom com -asaur. you've been described so and, and you have obviously a deep familiarity yeah. with, with romance and rom-coms how does that form your approach to these kind of more classical stories of love Oh my God, so much. Actually, it was a joy to write this book because I got to play with so many genres of rom-coms. Because rom-com, rom-coms are like a universe on their own. So with Nelly, for example, that's a high school rom-com. With Sia, you have kind of a more adventurous one. Um, and Shaharaze is like a, like a sexier one, it's a more grown one. Um, and so I got to play with so many different worlds. So again, like with Nelly, that was like going back to all my, my favorite like high school rom-coms and thinking about the best parts of them. It's like, them, Nelly, and when we enter the story, Nelly's kind of hanging out with her best friend on the wall watching the popular kids. That's completely inspired by um, my steady intake of American high school rom coms as I was growing up. Um, and I like kind of Black Panther, Game of Thrones, which is not a rom com, but also I wanted to make people realize that romance and rom coms and that kind of thing can exist within different genres. It doesn't have to be like just one specific thing. Um, 
yeah but I always in, in all my stories especially within dialogue I like to infuse a little bit of humor because I feel like romance and humor really go back go together so well and really um clarifies um the humanity of romance I think so I know a lot of these stories are new maybe to U.S. readers they might not know them is there a story in particular that you were really excited to bring to a new audience Um, I think like a lot of them will be new, especially the ones that are set in Africa, which I'm so excited about. The first one is called Oshun, which is um, based on Yoruba mythology, folklore. Yoruba is an ethnicity within Nigeria. I'm a Yoruba, my family is Yoruba. So I was really excited to, for me, even just researching the stories and, and learning about the mythology of my people was really, really cool. Um, and I, so I hope that like at the end of the the book this like source of inspiration also go follow up and be like oh, actually where did the story come from I kind of research the cultures the thing is like love is really a great way to understand humans and I think what a great way to introduce people to so many different cultures it's pretty universal yeah that's that's a good point exactly the most universal course I think I think the other thing you know and just uh sort of um researching and looking through your book and and um the universal language of, of um, music plays sort of a big part in um, uh, in in you. You're such. I I went down the rabbit hole of music based on the music <laughs> that you have been talking about online. Oh yes. Oh my god. Um, and so. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, we have a link. Um, right. Do we put it on here? No, that's very impressive. Yeah, that's cool. That's um, an interview that you did um, with uh, Clemency Burton Hill, who's off also a HarperCollins author. She wrote uh, Year of Wonder, which is about classical music. And so that is a real, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I yeah. found that super fascinating to hear about, I don't know, just how sometimes when you're stuck writing or, or even when you're not stuck or just how ins inspiring music was. And so this this uh, playlist was created for you. And it was interesting to listen to that music and listen to your response to it and how it, how that mm. reverberated with you. Yeah, music is a huge part of my writing process. Um, I actually used to write music. I used to play the guitar and I used to write songs. And so when I write, I have that kind of lyricism in me because like I'm trying to get Oh, I'm not, I don't think I could be a very good singer songwriter, but all that excess energy I can put into my writing. So that's what I do. And um, I don't know, when I think about love, I really think about a rhythm and it's a really soulful feeling. And it's about pulse and ticking. And I just feel like music does that. Music is also as primal as love for me. And so they just go hand in hand. So even in Loving Color, there's so many reference, not as much as I wanted to, it to but like there's a, there's a few references to music, even in Oshun, the first story, there's a, he's like, he plays a drum. Emily Lay plays the drum and it's like heartbeats. And like, I like the, the rhythm of the heartbeat and, and music. I just love in Thisbe as well. Um, that's a love story that literally they fall in love with each other by kind of listening to each other's music taste. And I think music is such a great way to know someone and an insight into what someone is like. And um, yeah, it's a great connector like romance. So I think they just, yeah, I love it. And it just puts me in the mood as well. It's great ambience. Yeah, it's just very atmospheric. So yeah, I actually made a loving color playlist. This one's Spotify. Where's the loving color playlist? It's on Spotify. It's just loving color. If you just type in loving color or my name and loving color, it should come up on Spotify. Oh, um, I'll try and send a link somewhere. Okay, um, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I loved your. Um... I loved your conversation with um, Clemency uh, about uh, Swan Lake and that whole story, you know, and that mythology, mm. fairy tale. Um, I, I just thought, you guys, you've got yeah. to listen to this. It's a really fabulous interview. Um, and I, I, um, I was just taking some notes. Brian McKnight, Never Felt This Way, Hello. Oh my God, that song is amazing. And you said that oh my God, yeah. all the time and cry. It's beautiful. 
any time I've listened to that song like a million times and I still cry every time like I think I was like maybe like 15 or 14 or something when I first heard it and I was like oh my god like I was just crying and I didn't know what was happening to me yeah. and still to yeah. And I really feel like that is how love feels. Like you can hear the yearning, you can hear the soul in it. Um, it's yeah, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Music is a really great way to get me into the mood of writing about romance and love when I feel stuck. I, yeah, that 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 was uh that was something that you had said to her, and I thought that I can see you, you know, I can understand that. Um <laughs> and I love that she said that, you know, your recommendations. The part of what um, you know she does there, um, uh, Clemency Burton Hill is is was sort of getting a whole new playlist thanks to you. You know, um, yeah. it, NDRE was that the other one? Yeah, I can't remember which song it was. There's so many NDRE songs. I mean, there's Ready for Love, which is a That's gorgeous it. song. Yeah, um, oh, that song makes me cry so much. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> So beautiful and again it hits on that yearning because like most people in the world want to be loved and want to experience love and love is one of those weird things that seems really a mundane because you see it everywhere and then we forget how sacred it is and how special it is and how really quite like not to be corny but how magical it is um, because it's so it's seemingly ubiquitous you know yeah well you I mean You've done so much here, you know, talking about, you know, most of the characters are of color. You talk about little girls of color, how they're taught that all these fairy tales with these, you know, uh, blonde hair, blue eyed. And that's like, you know, you've turned this upside down. And I think it's just so empowering and so thank uh, you, really so strong and um, so necessary. I also love Nefertiti We're running out of time. Can you talk about Nefertiti? Because oh, yeah. it's so cool. <laughs> oh, Nefertiti was one of my favorite stories to write. I'm gonna I say that about like, my stories, but Nefertiti really was like one of my favorite stories yeah. to write because um so Nefertiti, I cheated a bit because it's like it's not really mythology or folklore, but I was like, actually, I just want to do it. So Nefertiti did exist, but we don't know much about her. So what I did was research um ancient Egyptian like philosophy, religion, and personify that. So Nefertiti is um a queer um woman of color um she's a queen she she's we're kind of in a dystopian version of ancient egypt egypt she runs a nightclub she's kind of she's a crime lord um she's kind of like a robin hood but instead of stealing from the rich and give to the poor she kind of murders <laughs> murders evil men to save women um and she falls in love with uh, matt or matty who is the personification of the egyptian concept of um justice and the that name is actually matt um and i re i just had so much fun by like bringing these concepts of justice and injustice to life and um the police force um is called is the egyptian word for chaos um and it's about so that story is really about justice and what it means about uh, what what how what how the role of love in relation to justice because I think that a lot of people imagine love as really soft and sweet, and it can be, but love can also be a very strong force for good. And love can also be anger, and love can also be righteous. And in Nefertiti's case, she has a love for her women and her people, and there's also this like romantic love with Matt. Um, and also by making Matt that kind of the personification of justice, I was talking about, I wanted to explore how the idea of justice can be um, complicated you know and sometimes um it doesn't look like what we think it can look it looks like um but it was really fun to write really fun to kind of bring ancient egypt to life in that kind of sexy kind of nightclubby way <laughs> yeah yeah and the nightclub even has its own history it's just a cool it's a it's a really cool story and i love also love that you um the the anthology thank you includes, uh, with a story about your parents which i find really lovely yes um yeah so there's three original stories towards the end um, at the end and the last one is based on my parents um and yeah they met in school and then my dad stayed in lagos to go to university and my mom stayed in went to university in england and where he later joined her but they wrote letters to each other and um i think their love really made me romantic and seeing their friendship and their connection so it was a really nice way to pay homage to them 
Um, and also because it was a love story that I grew up with, I just really felt really lucky to be able to share that with the world as well. Because I was always inspired by it. So I was like, oh, maybe I can inspire other people with it too. Oh, that's so, that's so yeah. wonderful. And um, yeah. You really paint their story. Like it didn't, it didn't fade. It doesn't feel like it faded, you know? No, yeah. They're still best friends. They're still exactly the same. They're really happy with the story, which is what I was scared about. Oh, that's I was like, cool. I'm literally writing their story. That's a lot of pressure, but um, yeah, they love it. And um, yeah, it, it inspires me to this day. And I think um, I really wanted that connection to come through in all my stories. I feel like it was a very fitting way to end the book because um, it kind of, that's what inspired the rest of the stories, their connection and their friendship. And I really wanted to make sure that all my characters generally liked each other and were partners. Because sometimes you read stories and you're like, I don't know why these people are together. They don't even seem to like each other. They don't get on, they don't laugh. So I really wanted that to, to be a theme in my stories. You're like, okay, I get why these people will match. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so true. Don't you find, find yourself doing that a lot? Going, Why are they together? <laughs> um, so there's so much, there, there's, this book is just so beautiful. And it, I think we were going to ask you if you would just read, Chris, what were you going to, um, what part were oh, yeah. you going to read, Bolu? Was it? Um, Shiharadze. Shiharadze, okay. yeah. Um, so I can read the first two. Paragraph. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, now I'll read the first paragraph. Okay. First two, yeah. Cool. I suppose if I tell our story, I should start at the beginning. That's the convention, right? Once upon a time. Except you and I don't feel bound by the temporal. Not in a pretentious, mystical way, because I'm not into all of that, but very basically, we were not a once and we were never pinned to a time. I felt this even when I told myself we were just a transient thing. I don't think I ever fathomed a time when I wouldn't know him. Not fully, not comprehensively. At first, I'd assumed I would move on because that's what I usually did and I was good at it. I like to do things that I'm good at as a general rule. I thought that it would end as a matter of course. All things end and so I always thought sought to deal with romance by making the experience shorter, by controlling the length. By limiting the length, you can make the experience sweeter, like a six episode season of your favorite TV show. It's less able to disappoint you, less able to mess up cast development and leave threads hanging. My character development was finite and I liked to keep my, keep my threads taut. I thought that there was beauty in the ephemeral and that I was being an assistant by hastening the death of a relationship. But if I'm honest, and I figure that I have nothing to lose by being honest here, I never really sat down and considered what it would mean for my life to not have him in it. I must have been scared to. I'm not usually scared of anything. I should have known then what this love was. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> read the rest of it. Lady, did you want to, so we have just a minute or two left. Is there anything that uh, you guys want to bring up? Oh, I think I know what you want me to bring up, which <laughs> I do want to know about. You're probably tired of talking about it, but uh, the whole Michael B. Jordan <laughs> Twitter viral oh, yes. tweet. Yeah. Can you please tell us about that and then what maybe led to you meeting him? <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was crazy because it was just a tweet. Like, it was a joke. Like, it was honestly a joke. Like, a few months ago, a few months before I sent that tweet, my friend had photoshopped a picture of me and Michael B. Jordan together as a joke because I had a massive crush on him. And then like the day I tweeted that, like somebody had tweeted like they had reunited with a long lost friend they met on a cruise or something. So I just wanted to riff on that tweet and make it like, I really thought I had like two likes. Like, <laughs> like it was a joke for my friend. I was like, hi guys, I met this guy last summer. Can you reconnect us? And it went crazy. And I think it went crazy because a lot of people were like, thought I was really serious. And they were like, that's obviously photoshopped How, Like they were really angry. And so <laughs> the more, and I just kept on, and then I just kept on replying like, it's not photoshopped and how dare you accuse me of thinking like this is real, this is the love of my life. And you were like arguing with me. And so it went more and more viral. And then it just really so happened to be the week before Michael B. Jordan was coming to London for the Creed 2 premiere. 
And I, I didn't really put two and two together. And then my agent was like, oh, by the way, you've got an invite to the, the premiere. I, I'm a culture writer as well. So I normally get invited to these things. Um, but I was like, okay, cool, I'll go. And I really wasn't expecting to do anything there. But then as I was going in, I saw some of my friends and they were like, you have to like stand up and be like, I'm the girl who <laughs> made you go viral. And I was like, oh God, maybe I have to do it. So I did, I stood up and I was like, hi, um, it's me, your long lost love. And he was so charming and so sweet about it. I was so game and like, he was like, let's get a picture afterwards and we got a picture together and yeah it was cool I was kind of nervous I thought he'd be like you're a freak security get her out here but he was so cute about it and it was really lovely but it was something that really was like I like he knew he was contacting me for interviews like I it went way out of my control I did not expect it to get that big it was really just meant to be a, like a tiny joke it was so smart I mean it's so funny because you see those jokes a lot but I guess in the end, Twitter really did come through and yeah. you got to meet him. So, I mean, I to meet him. it kind of worked. And I started freaking out because I was like, I'm a serious writer, guys. Like, I'm not just some girl that was just like, wants like a two minutes of fame with because of Michael B. Jordan. So it was funny. So when I started writing articles after, people were like, oh my God, Michael B. Jordan girl can write. And I was like, guys, <laughs> my job. Oh, now he's wanting to come and meet you again. It's the opposite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> as well he should yeah <laughs> such a fun yeah. story um, that was the story <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's, it's a great story good for that that's really funny um <laughs> well we, this went this flew by and um yeah. so but thank you so much for coming on thank and you talking to us thank you for having me it was such a pleasure thank you uh this has been great um so everyone out there listen do yourselves a favor love and color this is a beautiful beautiful collection um, of stories focusing on black love rooted in traditional tales often unfamiliar to western readers i just want to say that these serve as a jumping point for an exploration of feminism class conflicts domestic violence and other cultural issues all while ensuring that everyday stories have a happy ending sometimes um yes Sometimes. Um, sometimes it's life and it's wonderful. <laughs> and thank you so much. Uh, love and color. Bula Babalola. This goes on sale April 13th. And yes. um, we are just thrilled to have you here today. And um, thank you for writing this book. It's really thank amazing. you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking about it with you guys. Thank you. Okay. Well, take mm. good care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um. How do you make a heart? <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. Oh, you mean the guy that was in the photo with Bolu? Gotta reverse I love, that. I love <laughs> that she was like, you don't believe me? Go ask him. That's yeah. totally me. <laughs> That's hilarious. We got to get her on playlist. Yes. That's so cool. And you guys got to listen to that interview with Clemency Burton, it's amazing. And uh, I think the link, we put the link up there. Anyway, 10 stories that you won't forget and then the story about her parents is just beautiful. But boy, does she turn everything upside down and say, all right, listen, I'm not gonna lose the bones of this thing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, you, tell you how it is. Agency, we're all about the agency. So important. Okay, now, Jocelyn Jackson, let's do it. Lainey? Come on down. Come on down. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, friends. How nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see Hello. you. Too. <laughs> I'm going to mute oh. myself and let Aunt Lainey do the honors. So, hello, Jocelyn. I hope you enjoyed hey. our green room. It was uh, set up just for you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, Jocelyn Jackson, you're the New York Times and USA Today best selling author of the 10 books, um, including Gods in Alabama and Never Have I Ever. Um, and your books have been translated in more than a dozen languages. And you're also, you know, an award-winning audiobook narrator because you have so much time on your hands. <laughs> I don't know how you get it done. Um, and you're Insomnia. a library <laughs> Insomnia. Like if you don't sleep, you're tired all the time, but you have a 20-hour day. So. <laughs> well, there you go. That's all you have to do. 
Um, and your Library Reads Hall of Famer. Never have ever, July 2019, put you in the Hall of Fame. Um, and you have three other books before. Yeah, that's so exciting. And um, Entertainment Weekly has called you a master of domestic suspense. Um, and your newest book, Mother May I, which I have on the screen, is so good. It's so twisty. Couldn't put it down. There it is. My hot uh, bookmark. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little bit later. So I marked that with a crumpled piece. It looks like a recipe. Oh, well. I love it. Vegan well, tikka masala. <laughs> um, I think you should write a book with your don't sleep and here's the recipe. And then you could just keep adding to it. There you go. <laughs> Um, could you want to tell us a little bit about Mother May I? I do. I'm very excited about it. Um, this is my second foray in domestic suspense. If you have read my earlier novels, I think I've always been kind of a thwarted mystery and suspense writer. You know, I'm Southern, so I have this thing where I want y'all to think I'm real nice. I'm not real nice, but I want you to think I am. So I think I wrote like every single one of my earlier books there, I do kill somebody. There's a murder mystery. There's always a, there's always plot twists. And with the last two books, I think I just got old enough for my give a crapper to break. I stopped caring if you thought I was nice and just wrote the book I wanted to write. And this is the story of a, a mom. Her name is Brie Cabot. She is um, a theater person and an actor. Oh no, I had the cats locked up and they escaped. Okay, sorry. Um, she is a theater person and she decided to get married and have a family instead of pursuing a career. And this was a really good choice for her. Um, she's really sort of benefited from second wave feminism and she can make those kind of choices. She has um, two daughters who are teenagers and then they had what my mom calls an oops baby. So her daughters are in middle school and she has a 10 week old son. She's married to a guy she really likes a lot. She grew up kind of um, working like that kind of not quite middle class, but just like a, a steady end with working class that's just barely kind of clinging to the edge. like. It's kind of the way I, I grew up, actually. I remember, like, we were fine. We had a place to live. We had food. I went to a nice school. But I remember one time my mom lost a $20 bill at the grocery store when I was really little. And she just sat down and cried. Like, she sat down and cried. There was She did not know what she was going to do for the next 10 days. So, um, so kind of like that, where one one slip and you could plumb it off the edge you're fine but it's tenuous and she's sort of really come up in the world she's married very very well and a lawyer who whose family comes from money and she is a good person i really like her um and one day she's watching her daughter's play rehearsal in the middle of this very nice life and she does that thing where you look away for just one second and when she looks back, the car seat is gone. And there's a note that says, if you want to see your baby again, go home, we'll contact you. And of course, because this is a Jocelyn Jackson novel, if you've ever read one of my novels, you know this is not like a kidnapping ransom book. This is, there's more to it than that. In, in my books, the past is alive, the past has teeth. And in this book, the past is calming for Brie. I love that. And I love that you said she's a good person. And I like that about her because that's something that I think a lot about with this book, but also with Never Have I Ever. I feel like a lot of a lot of suspense or thrillers, I feel like the main character is usually pushing that point like, what can I get away with? What can I do to be just a good enough person to get away with what I want, really? But I feel like characters in both of these stories, especially mother may I like they're really good people and they have a conscience and well, so they're, they're flawed but I do think they're, I think they're yeah I mean you know yeah I think I, I really do write like for me books always begin with the characters and if I don't care if they get shot in the face I feel like the stakes get really low I, I do love mysteries and thrillers but I do prefer them when I care if who makes it to the end you know rather than 
everybody is a repulsive snake and it's sort of all serving a, a twist. Like those are fun too. And I'll, I'll read a couple of those a year, but this is more the kind of thing where you can see yourself in this position and think about what would I do? You know, this is not about a bunch of terrible people playing murder chess with each other, which is also a fun book, admittedly, but th that's not what this is. This is about real people who you might recognize yourself in put into very difficult, morally ambiguous circumstances with very high stakes. And what 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 would you do to to navigate the situation or survive? Yeah, exactly. And so do you, you said you character driven. So does it kind of start with the character or do you kind of always know where you want them to end up? What is that? No, right? plot comes last. If I knew, like if the twist didn't surprise me, they wouldn't surprise you. Like I know the characters, I put them in this situation and then like, I, I, I know them really well and I sort of set up their life and then I look for the most important thing and then I set it on fire and then I watch what they do. And that's the fun part for me. Like, you know, I'm, I mean, this is, this is domestic suspense. It's a fun read. You are, you should get a big drink and go to the pool, you know, in April, if you live in a place where that's reasonable or just in your cozy chair, if it's still cold where you are then there, but it, it's fun. You will have fun, but I, it's, also, it's also a book about privilege. It's a book about, um, opportunity, like um, the disparity of opportunity and the kind of moral choices that you get set up to make if you're a person who has multiple chances or the kind of person who really only gets one chance. Um, I think my, my favorite thing about the book is that, and this is not a spoiler, you find this out almost immediately, no spoilers. Um, the person who has taken Bree's child is also a mother and so she and Bree, as they communicate, as they're navigating this negotiation, um, and the, this other mother has definite, a definite agenda of things she wants Bree to achieve. I mean, the, the tagline on this is revenge doesn't, revenge doesn't wait for permission. So this is a revenge story to some degree. And this other mother has enlisted Bree's help in this. And they really understand each other. Like there's almost this empathy that grows between them where they see each other's souls but at the same time they're both in very different ways fighting for their own children so no matter how much they can see each other's point of view like a conflagration is unavoidable yeah yeah well exactly that empathy that we were talking about like they you they still have something there that makes them understand even if don't really get it they can see where the other person's coming from um, and it's so hard to talk about this book because there's so many things. I don't want to give anything away. But um, when you talked about motherhood, uh, um, but you also mentioned in the podcast, which I think we should tell them all, you did a podcast with your editor, Emily Crump, and it was amazing. We love that podcast. And you guys can go listen to it on our feed. But you, in there, you said that this was, you work some things out in this book, which I love. <laughs> I did. When I say that it is a, like, if you've ever read any of my books, you know I, I like to layer storylines. So there's this one arc that goes through the whole thing, but there's several little subplots that are happening. And one of them, I did work some things out. I, you know, maybe there are some things that you might want to have. Uh, hmm, probably I shouldn't say too much more about that. But I think this book can be cathartic in a lot of ways for women, especially. I love it. <laughs> speaking of the uh, the podcast with your editor emily crump I, which i highly recommend laney said we're done you guys have got to listen to this and it's like oh my god it's just a great energy and it's very um informational and it's very intimate because you guys have just got this you know you sort of like share the same brain sometimes it feels like but um i love when you talk about uh what goes into writing a book and your advice to anyone who wants to write a book is to read. Um, if you're not reading, I think literature is a conversation and whatever you're trying to write, you need to be listening before you can talk or you don't even know what the, what's happening in the conversation. It's like that 
person on a plane, you know, you get set beside a person on a plane who really has a lot of information about spiders. And that is not, well, I actually kind of might would be interested in that, but it depends on how interesting the person is, but maybe they want to talk about World War II or model airplanes or <laughs> something that you don't really care about. That's not a good conversation. They might leave thinking they've had a great conversation and you might leave thinking, you know, um, if you're not listening, you shouldn't, you, you can't talk. You, you're not going to be able to follow the thread of it. So you need to be, if you want to write, you need to be, you need to be a reader. And every writer I know that I respect and love their books when I've met them, one of the first things I found out about them is what a passionate and connected reader are. Like, these are the kind of people that you you end up in bars with at two in the morning and they they know poems like the, you'll just end up saying your favorite poems back and forth or like, you know, everybody has a bar trick, right? Mine is there are certain poems I can say in under like eight seconds in one breath. <laughs> I won't do it, but I can't. I could if I wanted to. That's a threat. Um, so, yeah, you get, you've got to be first a reader. And I am I'm a huge reader. Um, I think that we should have you back and do nothing but bar tricks. Oh, God, that would be so fun. Oh, my God. Wouldn't that be a blast? It would. We, you know, I have some suggestions. We could get a little group of authors together that have some really great bar tricks. Hey, I brought, I brought some visual aids. Do you want to see my visual aids? Sure. Okay. So if you look at what I love this cover, come on, that is fantastic. And when, when they sent it to me, this is the very, very first cover that Moro ever, I mean, the covers are usually like this long negotiating process between the art department and your editor and your publisher and your agent. And this one, it just, it just came through and everybody was like, oh, yep, change nothing, that's perfect. And I loved this little carousel that's in the middle, like this abandoned toy carousel ominously lying in the grass. So I went online and I tried to find it. And that is, I mean, if you look, that is the, wait, that's the exact, that's it, that's the guy. And the most terrible thing is, I won't crank it for very long because it, it will go on, but like the song that it plays is the most horrible, ominous, Um, so I, I don't know, I like that. And then another cool thing, and this was, there's a woman who works at Moro named Tavia, who I just love. She's amazing. She thought of this really cool thing. So this is a, a box, but <laughs> it's a box. No, it's not. If you open it up, there's, it's got a puzzle in it. Like, and if you put it together, it's the cover on one side. But on the other side, it's a two-sided puzzle, so you can do it twice for extra fun. Um, on the other side, it's the ransom note that is actually in the book that uh, that refines when Robert disappears. And what's kind of fun about that is it's actually my handwriting. Octavia called me and was like, can you write the ransom note? Of course, I have an iPad, so I could just write it as a picture and send it to her. So it's a two-sided little puzzle I don't know I just thought that was really cool because it is a mystery like it is a puzzle some kind and of there work. might be two different mysteries happening so it all works on different levels is that true oh look at the brains on that one <laughs> there are there are two mysteries that sort of co uh happen in here so Thank you for sharing that and uh Chris Laney do you want to mention anything about some possible puzzles keeping them all to myself no we have some puzzles to give away so if you ask a question we'll be put in to enter that so be the first to ask we have a few coming in so oh good i like i like that i you know when we do stuff like this i'm a little bit chatty i can talk about just about anything but it's so much more fun if we talk about what you want to talk about well the thing is that we have we, we could go this is the tricky thing about talking to an author um, about their about their book because you can screw it up. Not you, we, I could screw it up. I interviewed <laughs> Laura Lippman when um, uh, was it? I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the book, but it was amazing, and it was um, 
I didn't know what to say after a while because I thought I'm going to give it away. And so there, I'm leaving that alone. And we're and we'll maybe we'll go to some questions, you guys. What do you think? Sure. So Kelly Moore asked, was it hard to pivot from domestic women's fiction to thrillers? And how did it change your writing process if it did um, as you were plotting or writing? Um, I did not make a decision to do this. I'm not a, I'm not the kind of person who makes decisions and does things. Wouldn't that be great? Sounds so organized. Um, what happened was I started writing Never Have I Ever. And I read, uh, I read very eclectically and I read a lot of suspense and about four or five chapters in, I was like, I am writing domestic suspense. And so I had to call my editor and be like, hey, so Emily, I know that I was supposed to be writing this, but it seems to me I'm writing domestic suspense. And so I, and I, I do not let people see my work before it's done, like ever like I have my little tiny writing group that looks at my horrible drafts and I show it to my mother like my mother reads my books like 25 times as I write them and I can send her like the worst my first draft it's terrible and she's like well this is just the best chapter I have ever read it's like my ship picture up on the refrigerator like my mom is just so affirming and then I'll send it to her when it sucks a little less and she'll be like well, I did not see how you could possibly make that better, but you have made it better. Like she's the best, but I would never show it to my editor, but I did. And she really liked it. So I sort of felt empowered to write the book I wanted to write. And then like we had just written a new contract out and I wouldn't even say the second book in the contract would be domestic suspense because I didn't know, but it, then it is. And now I really like it. Like now the next few books I'm thinking about are definitely in this thing. Neat. Um, Maureen Roberts from Baltimore says, did you live in the South your whole life? How important is that setting in this book or your other novels? Um, I lived all over the South growing up, except for one year that I don't remember because I was so little. Um, I lived in, in California from the time I was one to two. Most of the time I lived in the South, but I did not write about the South until I went to graduate school in Chicago. And I think I had to be out of it and have some distance to see how freaking weird we are. And then I started writing about, I started understanding my culture from that distance. And I started wanting to parse and write about my culture. And it is, it is important to me. You know, I was an expat, an expatriate in the North for um, almost seven years. And I don't think, I don't think without that, distance I don't know if I would still be a I don't know if I would have written the kind of books that I write without that perspective and I mean even though I've shifted genres I do set my books in the south and that I I do like a strong sense of place in a book so it still matters Chris yeah, I have one from Becky who asks and this could apply to this, but also all your books, where do the, where do the ideas come from? Are, are, is that something you see in headlines? Did that, does that ever inspire you? Uh, no, what's the magic? I, I, it's people. It comes from people. I get very interested. You know, I, I started out as an actor, which is why I read my own audiobooks. I honestly think that very few authors should read their own audiobooks, but I had actually worked as a professional voice actor and a theater actor, but, and I was, and a playwright. I had had several plays produced before I started writing novels. And um, so for me, it always comes from characters. And I was not a very good playwright. My plays were funny, but they were kind of, I think, shallow and kind of mean. Uh, trying to write plays comes from like my occipital lobe, whereas novels and acting both are very front. Like this part of my brain heats up and I get really excited. And so it feels to me like an acting job to write a book. Like it's almost like writing a monologue. I tend to read it aloud. I tend to be very performative as I'm doing it. Like when I write an action scene, a lot of times I will get my children or my furniture and set it up so I can visualize how it would go. I remember I was on a writing retreat with a couple of actor friends and um, I was at Sarah Green's house. She's, she's in my writing group. And um, 
I had her, I needed her to be like a six foot tall man. So she stood on a chair and then I, I was seeing like, if I punched her where my fist would land. So we're standing there trying to see where I would punch her and her husband walks through and he's like, Oh, Hey, Jocelyn. <laughs> Cause it was just such a normal thing for me to be doing that me having his wife standing on a crate, punching her repeatedly in the stomach was just, oh, Jocelyn got here. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> so it is, it starts from the character. Like I build a character and I see what they care about. And then the story comes from me wanting to explore that person's response to the world. <clears throat> well, we've, sorry. Yeah. No, I just want to say Katie Stover from Kansas City Public Library says, listen to Jocelyn narr narrate her books in audio format. They are even more fun in audio. And she's a oh, well, I, is, what is her name? Katie? Katie? Katie Stover. Katie Stover, you are a beautiful woman of taste and substance. I can tell. <laughs> well, we can oh, concur. Well. Yeah, well, that's true. We do. We love her. Love her. Okay, you guys. Um, so we've talked about reading and you were saying, you know, I know you're just, you read all the time. We've talked and on the podcast, shameless plug, go listen to the podcast. Um, we've talked about how much you have read during the pandemic. So Casey Davis wants to know during the pandemic, what have you been reading? I've been reading a lot of, um, feminist horror <laughs> during the pandemic. For some reason, that is a big escape for me. Um, favorite books have been like bad heroines, um, uh, Mexican Gothic, My Sister the Serial Killer, um, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Like, that has been my jam. Okay. You can concur yes. with many of those. I know Lainey and I are all about it. So, uh, let's see here. I mean, so we're, we're now 10 books in, so you, you stand on your own, obviously, and then some, that's an understatement, but do, are there authors, this is from our friend Lillian Dabney, are there authors or books that, like, inform your writing or inspire your writing? Oh, yes. I mean, yes. There are, I have, like, authors like um, Lydia Netzer, Jen Phillips, Michelle Richmond, that if they have a book at Laura Lippman, never miss a Laura Lippman book. Um, where if they have a book out, I'm reading it that week because these are writers I feel like I'm in conversation with. And some, sometimes characters come out of reactions to those books or a sentence or a phrase or something that, that seems interesting to me. So, so and yeah, so of, of course. <laughs> Speaking of Laura, the book that I was thinking of was um, Sunburn. Oh my God, that's one of my favorite of hers. So, so noir. That's so noir. It's so. And I don't want to give anything away. I'm trying to think about how to say this, but there is, like, it's really not. I write a lot about motherhood. For me, motherhood was a transformative experience. And this, that is not a book about motherhood, but it is. Like, yeah. there's a, yeah, it is. And it's, it's so interesting it's a it's it's a very it's a very sexy book too i thought like just a, the heat you can yep. feel the heat in that book yep and it's a hard book to talk about because you really could mess it up you know for the reader you know it's really tough yeah. but it's just so like it's true i you know i'm and I'm, I'm one of those people who like like when i when i am writing a book or reading a book like i don't like to read 80,000 words to get to a twist. I want, like, I always try to put the first big twist somewhere in the 25, 30% of the book range, and then it keeps going from there. And, um, but that makes it hard to talk about the book because, you, you know, it's not like you can say a lot of the setup because I like things to already not be what they seem and, you know, I don't want to go for 80,000 words to find out it was the sister, you know, like I want, I want a windingness to happen. And I want that as a, as a writer, as well as as a reader and sunburn is that way. And the mother may is definitely that way where things keep turning 
all the way through. Like once you hit a certain point, you know, and then it's down and twist and upside down and a loop and like that. Exactly. That's, that's, and well, we're not the only ones who feel that way. There are wonderful raves already in for this book. Um, Mary Kubica, uh, she says, Jocelyn Jackson does it again with this explosive white knuckle read about a mother who will stop at nothing to protect her family. Terrifying, timely, and thought provoking. I couldn't tear my eyes away from Mother May I. That's Mary Kubica. That's, that's very, I mean, she's so gifted. We have pages of these quotes because everybody concurs. That's the, that's the word of the day here at this hour is that we concur, that you are amazing. Uh, oh. This book is really, this book is wild. Um, quick plug for, which I forgot to do, but um, you were very sweet and um, genuine and wonderful with Bolu Babalola who needed to hop off. But I love that you are such an early fan of her book. I um, am, I even have, this is called another visual aid. I had this book before anybody in this country, a friend of mine sent it to me when it came out in the UK. So my version has the U and I did not know my publishing house had acquired it. Like when I found out Moro had it, I was like, oh, I love that book. And um, one of a, a person who works at Moro was like, you have not read it yet. I'm like, yes, I have. But she was like, no, the ARCs aren't even out yet. And I'm like, bam, um, <laughs> got the U, the extra color, love and color. Um, so I, my, I loved, I thought the take on Cupid and Psyche was really funny. You guys didn't talk about that one from what I heard, but that, that, that's one I want to, it was, it's sort of set in this, in the current time and it's got this corporate, I don't know. I yeah. would also recommend that one. I liked it. Yeah. Um, and that, that was like, I, I was, I was the nerdy kid reading Greek mythology and I was obsessed with Cupid and Psyche, like to the point that. In fifth grade, I read, um, uh, uh, there's um, the guy who wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Oh, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis has written a version of the Cupid and Psyche myth that I read, Till We Have, Faith, Til the, Til we have Faces, that I read in fifth grade and found very disappointing and unromantic. I now actually love it. But as a fifth grader looking for more Cupid and Psyche literature, it was just bleakly disappointing. So I, I much, I prefer this <laughs> Take that, CS. That's right. Although I, I love CS Lewis. I know. I know. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. Um, but thank you. That was very sweet of you. And I uh, that was just a cool sort of, you know, such a I, yeah, the, it was a uh, it was nice, you know, it's it really is a small world. I know. I know. Well, I love when things like line up. And like that's another thing about being a big reader is these convergences happen that are super fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you want to, uh, we, we are like at 303, which is crazy pants. Oh, but sorry. I, no, don't be sorry. Are you kidding? We're, we can go all day. Who's going anywhere? But, um, <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, would you, uh, you had thought perhaps you might read a little bit. I will. I'm going to read three paragraphs. So it will be, it will be, and right. one of them is one sentence long. So you'll be all right. Nothing <laughs> I woke up to see a witch peering in my bedroom window. She was little more than a dark shape with a predator's hungry eyes, razor wire skinny, but somehow female staring in through the partly open drapes. Sunrise lit up the thin silvery hair that straggled out from under her hat. I should have leapt up screaming. I should have run at her with any weapon I could find. Instead, I thought, I hope she's not standing in my basil plants. Hazy and unworried, even half asleep, I knew that there was no such thing as witches. I've long forgotten the most important thing the theater had ever taught me, that the human body can hold two truths at once, even truths that seem to rule each other out. There's no such thing as witches true and i was looking at one dang so, oh, good. Good. so good so good i could listen to you read this whole thing we didn't even get into your whole theater background but you know my goodness for another time i suppose but 
Oh, I love listening to you read. Virginia, Lainey, and Chris, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. It's also, it's just fun to be with people and to get this chance to talk to a bunch of librarians, which, you know, you guys are like the dealers of my drug of choice. <laughs> well, you have bigger jobs than that, but that is a big part of your job is hooking me up with my fixes. And I love you and appreciate you. And I appreciate like you taking time out of your day to listen to me talk about my new book. And I, I know a lot of you will, will help it find its readership. And I appreciate that more than I can say. Like, I love my job and you're one of the reasons I get to keep my job. So you're sexy beasts. Thank you. Oh, you're getting so many thank yous right now in this chat. And uh, well, we thank you too. Um, and and to everyone watching today, it's great. It's just a wonderful hour to, to just be together. We miss you, Jocelyn, but it's so fun to see you and talk to you and to hear about this book, which has got so many people talking. Mother May I goes on sale um, April 6th. There it is. And um, we'll, uh, I don't know, what, what closing remarks do we all want? What do we want to say? Anything, Chris, Lainey? Mother May is so good and you guys are going to keep turning those pages and it twists and turns. So kudos. It was a wonderful read. Thank you. Bye. Take good care. Thank you so right. much, Jocelyn. And uh, everybody. Someday. Wait a second. I got to read this to you before you go. Todd Kruger says that was another wonderful door to door. Thanks to Library Love Fest. That's not what I meant to read, but why not? Jennifer Winberry says, amazing. Thank you. Best part of our jobs, dealing books. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad to be your uh, suppliers, but the suppliers come with the supply, which is Jocelyn Jackson and the like. So thank you. Be well, take good care, and we'll see you again soon. And thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. No. Are we off? Should Jocelyn? we be off? We're not off yet. I can <laughs> know if that was our formal goodbye. Oh wait, are we still live? Well we didn't do we didn't do the, the big the big goodbye. Oh, so I, I was wait, confused. are people still watching? We're still yeah, they're still watching. Okay. Then one thing I want <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Come you on. Send me like a flowers. That's amazing. I was, so, I was like, I was so close. Oh was God! So I wish I had sat next to you in school. We'd have gotten in trouble all the time. All the freaking time. God, jeez. I uh, want to show you guys my mug. Oh, is do, 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 do. Everyone's still watching. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Zoom meeting mug for when somebody says something I don't like. I take a step, but then I forget I'm using it, and I just drink. <laughs> Then you do a spit take. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Hilarious. I love that. Um, All right. What's the big goodbye we're supposed to do? Oh, uh, well, first, I just want to say before we do the big um, dating game uh, kiss goodbye, uh, I do want to say that, yes, I do want to say on Thursday, this Thursday, the Library Love Fest team is going to be on for a quick uh, door to door talking about some nonfiction. So if you like nonfiction, come back on Thursday at 2 o'clock. That's all I wanted to say. And now, and now, Oh, Jennifer Winberry needs your cup, needs your mug. That's Jennifer Winberry. Sure this is from a fellow author, um, Lydia Netzer, who's also in my writing group, sent this to me for Christmas. And it's been my favorite Zoom meeting cup ever since. <laughs> Christmas. I love that. That's the best. Oh, I could just do this all the time. We're going to come back and <coughs> we're going to do, we're going to do um, bar songs, uh, bar poems. <laughs> Bar tricks. Bar tricks. Got a yeah. man. I have a lot of bar tricks. I'm <laughs> mostly Irish, so. It can't be bar tricks. It just comes with the territory, for God's sake. Let's just own it. We'll just own it. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. All right. So, dating game, goodbye kiss. Should we? Okay. Here we go. On the count of three. One, two. Mm -hmm.